Okay, um, we will continue moving on then. I'll just hop off of online test mode and I'll go back to the, the HMI as well. We'll take a look at one more type of timer or not a type I guess but a different method of implementing the timer. Uh, so same procedure as before, we're going to place the button on the screen. I'm going to give it the text and call this one on two. And assign a touch property as well to the next available, MB2 in this case. And I'll call it my on button two. So I just gave it the text for on2, assigned a touch property for MB2 here. And that's all that we really need. I'll move this guy up. And now as well, I'll add another binary image switch as an indicator light. Oop, I need to draw that out. There we go. Okay, so I'll assign a link property. Next available as well happens to be MB3. Call it light output two. And just assign a, a image for my off and my on state. And hit OK. And real quick as well, we'll put a another type variable timer. And we don't need to have the, the preset again, so we'll just do current this time. And we'll do minutes, seconds, hundreds of seconds. Assign the link. We want to use the next available timer here, which is going to be T1. And I'll just call it timer 2. And I'll give it six seconds this time. Power up. So we're really just going to be displaying the current time of our timer number one on the HMI screen this time. So hit OK. And let me say what we're actually going to do as well. Before you noticed um, you had to hold down this on button, the timer would count down, and then the light would come on. But if you release the button at any point, the timer stops counting down. So, I mean, there are certain instances where that's good, but what if you want to have it so you push the button one time, a certain condition one time, uh, then you want the, the output to be on and the timer to count down and then have the, the output shut off once the timer has expired. Um, so we're going to do that this time, so making it, you only have to push the button once, it's going to turn on our output, count down, and as soon as we finish counting down, uh, we'll, we'll shut that output off. So that's, that's all that we need for the HMI here, our button to press one time, our light to indicate that we're on, and just so we know where we are as far as the timer counting down, we'll have the current variable timer window as well. So over to the ladder now. I'm just going to minimize these by double clicking so I have more screen space. And also insert a comment. Call this my timer two. Now, um, I said we're going to push it one time, so to do that, we're going to use a one-shot type of contact, a positive transition contact. Uh, you can find this also under the Boolean menu, contacts and positive transition. So what this is going to do, basically, once we hit the, the button a single time, the, the contact here is going to recognize the, the rise of the bit associated, and it's going to only do that for the, the single scan. So I'm going to place that down. Again, I'll look on my drop-down list here. And I want to link it to my on button number two. And hit OK. Now, I, I said I wanted to make it so you can push the button one time, and have the output turn on, and then the timer is going to count down. And once the timer counts down, we're going to shut the, the light off. So to make that happen, uh, instead of a direct coil this time, we're going to use a set coil. 
Again, you can just grab that on the middle here or also under the Boolean menu. I'll place that in series. And we're going to link this here to our light output 2 or MB3. So let me talk about set coils real quick. Um, there used to be you had to use a latching circuit if you wanted to have a, a type of hold, a hold action. Um, but we do have set and reset coils in Visiologic here, which they only require a single shot condition, a single scan, you know, for example, positive transition button press to enable the set coil. So the set or the reset coils only need to be pulsed for a single scan, and then they will hold their state until they're manually changed. So if you pulse the set coil here, it's going to hold its state. It's going to stay set until there is actually a reset coil somewhere in the program to, to have that go back to its low low state. Um, so it's a set and a hold, basically. Uh, so there's no latching circuit required. It's, it's built in with these type of set and reset coils. So we have our button we're going to press. We're going to set our, our light output. So the next element is going to be a direct contact, which will be placed in the net right below. So we still need we still need some constant condition to energize our timer for it to count down. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to use our light output number two as the enabling condition to energize the the timer number two coil. So we're going to push the button. It's going to set the output here, which is going to be on, allowing power to flow through MB3 here since it's in the on state. And then the other element we need is a direct coil which is going to be our timer that's energized by the light output too. So in this case, our T1, well, I named it timer 2, which is maybe a little bit confusing. Um, let me just change it real quick to 6 sec timer. It's really just a label, so it's not relevant to any type of programming, but it just makes things a little more confusing otherwise. Um, so we're going to energize our, our timer here as long as the light is on. Now, once the timer counts down, we'll, we will use a positive transition contact this time in the net right below. And here, it's going to go to our, our TD1. Hit OK. So the timer is being energized. Once the timer is finished counting down from at six seconds, the internal bit will go high which is going to be recognized in Net5 here by the positive transition contact. And what we want to do then is shut off our output. So we're going to shut off the light, which also therefore kills power to the timer. Um, so that's, that's how this is going to work here. Um, so this is just going to be linked to our light output 2, which is also MB3. So this is really a type, of, a type of set and hold circuit. Here we're using a timer, um, but whenever you're using any sort of any sort of uh, communication program, for example, um, you want to ensure that the, the communications is sent properly. It's a good procedure to have this, this two net type of process to uh, set with a, a single set coil, enable condition in the net right below, do whatever you want to do, in this, case, in this case counting down with the timer, um, and then reset that, that uh, enabler once you've completed the task. Um, so this, this type of timer, it is a three net process. But it allows you to count down with a single pulse, um, have the timer count down, and then reset that once we're done. So we'll go ahead and download this real quick. And it's telling us here that the timer value is different than what's previously in the controller. That's OK. We know what we're doing here, so we'll hit continue. As well, the images are different since we added that, that light output too. So I'm just going to hit yes. And it's ready to go, so I'll hit OK. Now let me hop into online test mode so you can see what's going on as well. Again, I'll pull up remote access under the view menu and then remote access. 
Okay, so this is kind of nice to do when you're testing as well. You can have the ladder open simultaneous with the screen. So you can see on the ladder code here as well, once I push the on number two, the, the set coil goes red. The output means the output is high. You can see the light indicator as well. Um, the timer counts down, and then the, the light shuts off. You can see here as well, the current time is counting down from six seconds. Once it expires, the bit goes high for the timer, which then, in fact, resets the, the light output. So this is really a three-net process versus the previous two-net, but it allows you to have a, a type of set and hold for your timers. Are there any questions on that? Okay, no questions means that uh, all is clear, which I guess it is, or maybe nothing is clear, so you don't know what to ask. What is the situation? Is it all clear here? I guess so. I guess so too. <laughs> so, now let's continue. I'm here to answer the questions. So, ah. Uh, all clear, thank you. Okay, and uh, I know we're going a little bit fast here as well, but um, I do plan on having these up on the web hopefully next week so you can go back and review it at a later point as well. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, just continue to or go ahead and ask them. Emil will be able to answer, and uh, that's really better that you understand what's going on. Uh, so Emil is here to answer as well. But if there's no questions at the moment, we'll continue. And uh, we'll take a look at one last type of timer. Uh, so we'll go back to the HMI portion. And you can see here, we are out of HMI, out of HMI real estate here. We don't have any more screen space to be able to utilize. Uh, so I'm going to show you now a method to be able to navigate between HMI screens um, so we can go back and forth and add an additional screen. So the first thing that we are going to do is when you are on the HMI portion on the left here and select the, the drop down here, see the different HMIs that we have. But what I want to do is right click on Startup Display. And then we have a couple options here. But what I'm going to use now is Add New Display. And you can see here it uh, gave me a second one down here. And I can insert a label for it. The default is just Display 1, 2, 3. But uh, you can give whatever name you like for it. Um, I'll just call it Screen 2. So now I have my two HMI screens. But I want to have some sort of method to be able to navigate between them. So um, we're going to insert a button on our first screen here to be able us to, to click back and forth. So like before, just the, the button with the square B. I'll place it down on the, the bottom right-hand portion of the screen. I'll give it a, a name, or I'll just insert the, the carrots or the, the slashes here, whatever they're called. Um, and then under Touch Properties, we want to assign a memory bit as well. Next available. I'll call it Nav to Screen to... So just a Touch Property gave it the, the arrows showing that we're going to navigate. And we'll say right in this case. So touch property on the button is the main, the main idea here. Now, in VisiLogic, there's two different ways that you can navigate uh, between your HMIs. You can do it via the ladder code. There's function blocks for that. You can insert the, the ladder logic if you'd like. But what's really almost easier, uh, they're built into the HMI portion of the screen here. There's these jump conditions you can see on the bottom left here. So it allows you to go between your different screens without any actual programming code in the ladder logic. So it's very useful. Uh, it makes it quite a bit faster. But again, you can do it either method that you like. If you have a preference, it doesn't matter. They both will essentially function the same way. Uh, you can make them function the same way. So we'll just use the HMI portion here since we're right here already. Two parameters you have to define are the jump condition and then the display that you want to jump to. So if you click in the jump condition area here, you'll see that there will be a, a square box that pops up. This browse button here, once you click in the number one, you got the browse button. Then I can click the browse and just